Chapter 11 Angular Momentum In the previous chapter, we introduced the kinematics and dynamics of rotation of a rigid object about a fixed axis. We started with the kinematic description, which likens the uh, kinematics of rotation of a rigid object about a fixed axis to that of one-dimensional translational motion. So we replaced x with theta, we replaced uh, uh, v with omega, we replaced a with alpha, and so forth. And then we move down to dynamics, we introduced torque, which replaced force, we introduced rotational inertia, which replaced mass, and of course, kinetic energy of a translational motion corresponds to kinetic energy of rotation. Now we're going to continue with this analogy. One of the things we learned in uh, the uh, dynamics of particle motion, translational motion, is the concept of linear momentum P, which is equal to m times v. We have not found the analogy of linear momentum in the case of rotation yet. Of course, if we're, if we're talking about rotation, then we use angular quantity in, instead of linear quantity, so naturally we would look at something called angular momentum, which would replace linear momentum for rotation. What is the usage of linear momentum. We know that in the case when the mass of a system is a constant, then we find the external force to be equal to mass times acceleration of the center of mass. If the mass is not a constant, then the most general case of Newton's second law is that the external force equals the change, the rate of change of linear momentum, dp over dt. Of course, if mass is a constant, it reduces to f equals ma. Right? That was uh, what linear momentum was for. And of course, linear momentum was an important quantity partly because it is often conserved. That is, in the, ex in the absence of external force, linear momentum is conserved. So just like conservation of mechanical energy, we often use conservation of linear momentum to help us solve problems. Is it possible for us to introduce the counterpart of linear momentum in rotation, called angular momentum, which also exhibits conservation uh, characteristics under the right circumstances? Well, if we follow this analogy, that is, we replace force with torque and linear momentum with angular momentum, then we expect the vector torque to do something similar to the vector force did, which was to change linear momentum. We expect the vector torque to change angular momentum. Okay, that, is, that would be the total analogy. So, let us focus on this approach. That is, we're going to first introduce torque as a vector. You know, so far, torque that we studied in the previous chapter was not even considered a vector because we didn't have to use the vector characteristics. Why? Because it's a rotation about a fixed axis. Therefore, there are only two possible senses of rotation, either clockwise or counterclockwise. A torque either produces a clockwise or counterclockwise angular acceleration. We can call one one positive, the other one negative. So we didn't really have to use the vector definition of torque. So, let us first make sure, how do you introduce the vector torque? Well, the thing about torque is that it's made, it, it has to do with two vectors. One is, of course, force. Right? In fact, I have a force here. This is called the line of action of the force. And then I have a point O, and I need to uh, figure out the torque of this force about that point. And how would I do that? Well, I can find a vector which points from this point and ends up in the line of action of the force. So you, all have, you see I have two vectors, R and F. The torque of this force about this point O obviously depends on both of these vectors, R and F. So the question is, how does one produce a vector quantity, which in this case, torque, which comes from two other vectors, in this case, R and F? Okay, so we're looking for a vector which is based on two other vectors. We want to create a vector out of two other vectors, and we know how to do that in general, and that is we must consider multiplication instead of addition and subtraction, because after all, R and F are totally different types. We cannot do addition or subtraction. So, we're looking for a multiplication of R and F such that the outcome is a vector. We have not learned that yet in math, so let us, let's look at the mathematics of this uh, vector product first. Okay, 
Let me introduce the so-called vector or cross product between two vectors a and b. The symbol I use is a cross b. It is to be differentiated as from a dot b or scalar product. You know a dot b is considered a scalar, it's defined to be a scalar with magnitude of a times b times cosine theta. Theta is the angle between them. Here, let me introduce a vector c, which is a cross b. So now I have what's called a vector product because the outcome is a vector. I use a cross to, to signify that. That's why it's called a cross product. C is a vector, so it's got magnitude and direction, right? Let me define the direction, the magnitude of C first. It is defined to be the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between them. Sine theta, not cosine theta. Now, why do we define a sine theta instead of cosine theta? Because it turns out that in many uh, mathematical formulas for physics and engineering, we find this combination very often, okay? That is why this is a useful definition. That's why we define it this way. And you will see our first application in this chapter. So this is the magnitude of the vector C, which is, which is the cross product between A and B. Now, the direction. First of all, you know A and B cannot be parallel to each other because if they're parallel, then theta is equal to zero and the, pro the vector product simply vanishes. So I simply say C equal to zero. I don't, have, I don't have to worry about its direction because it's zero after all. So let's assume that A and B are not parallel to each other. If they're not parallel to each other, then obviously I can uniquely define a plane which contains both A and B, right? That is the plane that I draw. That is a unique plane defined by vector A and vector B. And C is defined to be perpendicular to this plane, okay? So C has got to be perpendicular to the plane, which means it's got to be on that line, on that line like this, perpendicular to both vectors and perpendicular to the plane that contain both vectors. That doesn't mean C is uniquely identified because you can still choose C to be upward or downward. So the question is, which direction should I pick? Okay, to do so, we introduce a convention, a convention called the right-hand rule. And that convention says, if you want to figure out the direction of A cross B, a is the first vector, B is the second vector. So here's how you do it. Suppose this is A and this is B. Okay. Here is how the right hand rule works. You take out your right hand, point these four fingers towards the first vector A, and you wrap around towards the second vector B. The thumb will tell you the correct direction for A cross B. For example, in this case, this is A, right? going this way, so this is A, wrapping towards B, so C is up, okay? So the direction of C is like this. Now, what about B cross A? Suppose I do B cross A, not A cross B. So B is my first vector, A is the second vector. So remember, I must point these four fingers in the first vector, which is B, wrap towards the second vector. You see, this time C goes into the paper, so it's opposite. Therefore, strangely enough, from our definition, we know A cross B equals negative B cross A. The order matters. Usually it doesn't, but here, because of our definition, it matters. Okay, so this is how we define the magnitude and direction of C, which is the vector product, vector product of A and B. Given that, we can easily figure out the vector, cro vector product between two of these three unit vectors, i, j, and k. The reason why I want to do that is because any vector can be always expressed in terms of i, j, and k, the three components, x, y, z components. So if I know how to do i cross i, i cross j, and so on, then I can always find the vector product of a cross b depend using ax, ay, az, and bx, by, bz. Right? First of all, what is i cross i? Well, remember, the magnitude depends on sine of the angle between the two vectors. Right now, you have two identical vectors, so the angle between them, of course, is zero. You got sine zero, which is, of course, zero. Same thing with j dot, j cross j, and k cross k. Okay, next, let's look at i cross j. Look at uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, coordinate system here. So i is the first vector, j is the second vector, k is what you get. Okay, the magnitude is 
that of I times that of J times sine 90 degrees, right? This is 90 degrees right here. That of I, of course, the magnitude of I is 1, the magnitude of J is also 1, sine 90 degrees is also 1. So, the, what you get is a vector with unit magnitude and pointing in a k direction. So, I cross J equals k. What about J cross I? Well, that is negative k because it's opposite to I cross J. Okay, so that's negative k. What about J cross k? Okay, J this way, k that way, you see, you get I. Okay, so J cross k is I, k cross J, negative I, what about k cross i? k cross i. This is k, right? i goes this way. So you get j, right? You get j. What about i cross k? That is negative j. You know, you can easily use the right-hand rule to figure out all these, thing, all, all these things. You don't have to memorize them. It just comes out naturally. But we can look at these formulas. You can find some general rules that al allow us to figure out the result quickly without necessarily using the right hand. First of all, uh, these two quantities crossing each other cannot be the same. I cross I, J cross J, those are all zeros. Okay, So when you go I cross J, you get a third quantity K. J cross K, you get a third quantity I. K cross I, you get a third quantity J. Okay. Now, why do you get these negative signs? It's because the natural order is I, J, K, I, J, K, I, J, K. That's how these things happen in sequence. If you take I, and J, you get the next one, which is K. Okay, I and J, you get the next one, which is K. J and K, you get the next one, which is I. See that? J and K is I. And K and I, you get the next one, which is J. Now, if, if you jump order, if you, get, if you go J cross I, see, J is here, I is there, you crossed K. Okay, you jumped over K, you will get K, but with a negative sign. Right? K cross J, see here, this is K, this is J, right? You went past I, you jumped over I, you will get a negative I. That's where the negative sign comes from. Break the order. So this is how you figure out the cross product of uh, unit vectors. Once you do that, then I can of course express the, uh, the uh, cross product between any two arbitrary vectors based on their components. Let's see how I can do that. A cross B. I'm going to write down A in terms of the three components. So AXI, AYJ, AZK. Okay. Cross three components for B. BXI, BYJ, BZK. Okay. Now, how many terms do we have? Three terms times three terms. You got a total of nine terms, right? But out of these nine terms, three of them are zero. What are these three? Well, what about I cross I, right? J cross J, and K cross K. These are all zero. You got six terms left, okay? Six terms left. Out of symmetry, you know, two of these terms will, will, will be in I direction, two in J direction, two in the K direction. Let's look at what's in I direction, okay? To get I, you know, you have to, call, you have to take either J cross K, or k cross j, right? j cross k, that is a, y, and b, z, right? So you get a, y, and b, z. Let me use a different color highlighted, y, and z. And then also k cross j will also get you i. k cross j will also get you i, but k and j, you reverse the order, so you get a negative sign. That's a, z, b, y, right? So a, and B, but you put Z first, is you put Y second. That is the uh, component, the X component of the vector A cross B. Okay? Now, once you get that, you can add, of course, the Y component. You, have, you can start this all over again, but you just, if you look at these uh, symbols, you can just tell by symmetry, okay, what comes next. You see, you have y, z, z, y. x is missing y because it's the x component. Okay, so if you want to want the y component, then you know y would be missing. You got a, b here, minus a, b here. y is missing. You only have z and x. So which one do I put first? Well, remember i, j, k, i, j, k, right? z is ahead of x. Here, x and z, you jumped over y. That's why you had a negative sign. Okay, now, I'm sure at this point, 
you will know how to find the Z component or the K component. There we go. A, B minus A, B. You're looking for the Z component, so Z should be missing you getting only X and Y. The first term, of course, is the right order X and Y. The next term is the wrong order Y and X. That's why you get a negative sign. So that is how we find A cross B in terms of the uh, components AX, AY, AZ, BX, BR, BZ. You will find many, many applications of the cross product, just like the dot product. You'll find it in, starting from this chapter, you also find it in physics 1B, 1C, and many other things in physics and engineering. Okay, now let's look at our first application, the vector definition of torque. First of all, we know when we defined torque in a previous chapter, that's how we define it. We first, there's a, there, there's a force, F, and this line is called a line of action, right, line of action. And you have a point O, point of observation. We dropped a perpendicular, okay, called R perp, perpendicular to the line of action, and the torque was defined to be F times R perp. R perp is also called the lever arm. That was a scalar. In fact, that is just the magnitude of the vector torque. We did not consider its direction. Well, actually we did, but there are only two possible directions, clockwise or counterclockwise, because the axis of rotation never changes. Okay, but let's look at the most general case. How do we define a vector quantity called torque? Okay, suppose I draw a line starting from the point of observation, ending at any point on the line of action, not just that point, okay? That will be the closest point to here, right? But I'm going to draw this red vector, which ends at any point on the line of action. Of course, you have an arbitrary direction, an arbitrary length, depending on you know, the angle that you, that, that, you, that you set at. Okay, now let us cross, let us consider the quantity R cross F. What is the magnitude of R cross F? The magnitude of R cross F, according to our definition, is vector R magnitude, vector F magnitude, and then sine of the angle between them. Here is the direction of F, here the direction of R, there is the angle sine, there is theta between them, so sine theta. Okay, now, here's the thing. This looks very different from that, but if you take a closer look, there is R sine theta here, right? Look at this vector triangle here, I mean just rectangle triangle here. The hypotenuse is R, this angle is theta, so R perp, isn't that equal to R times sine theta? So this really is just F times R perp. It's just the magnitude of the torque that we defined in the previous chapter. Okay, but you see, R cross F is not a scalar anymore, it's a vector. Okay, this was just its magnitude that we defined. So we are going to introduce a vector form, the vector form of torque, whose magnitude is defined as force times lever arm, but it's also the same if I did, instead of producing a lever arm, I, let me just, just draw an arbitrary vectors ending at, you know, any other line of action and just, you know, include, cos, uh, include sine theta in it, I get the same result. So, R cross F is defined to be the vector torque, R cross F. So, when you define torque of a force, you obviously have to tell me two things. One is, how big is the force? That's F. And secondly, where is the point of, of observation? Because that will determine how we draw R. Okay, that is the vector torque. What about the direction of the torque? Well, R cross F. This is R, this is F. So R cross F, the way I draw it, it's a vector sticking into the paper. Okay, if I reverse F or reverse R, I get, an, I get a torque in the opposite direction. That is how we define vector torque. Given this definition, what I want to do now is to figure out what this torque is capable of doing. Okay, from our analysis, analogy speculation, we know just like external force will cause rate of change of angular momentum, I ex uh, uh, rate of change linear momentum that is, I expect this torque to produce the rate of change of something called angular momentum. Okay, let's do that.